Okay. Good day, everybody. This being it being 11:38 a.m. on Friday, April 2nd, 2021, I'm calling to order a meeting of the Westboro Board of Selectmen. Three items on the agenda today. Our first item is a discussion and vote to amend the town's personnel policies. And I believe Christy or Kim or Kim will be presenting that to us and providing the overview. Um, I think we can take both of the first two items at the, at the discussion at the same time, because it really, um, okay. is, I think, comes together. And then Just you can take separate votes. Sorry, do we have to read the uh, governor's oh. piece oh, yes. in here? Oh, I should do that. Thank you for the reminder, Ian. No problem. Because I look for, I, I would have regretted missing this. Um, so pursuant to the governor, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place, this meeting of the Westboro Board of Selectmen will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town of Westboro's website at town.westboro.ma.us. For this meeting, Members of the public who wish to watch the meeting may do so in the following manner. Westboro TV's online platforms, including youtube.com slash Westboro TV and Westboro TV.org, or on cable channels, Charter Channel 192 or Verizon Channel 28. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. In the event that we aren't able to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the town of Westboro's website, an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. So that's the governor's orders. Thank you, Ian, for reminding me. Um, so why don't we handle the discussion since they're closely related? One discussion um, to amend the town's personnel policy and to prove the position description and classification for the temporary position of vaccine clinic coordinator. So I'll hand it off to Christy and to Kim. Okay, um, so um, as the board's aware, uh, we were approved for a regional vaccine clinic um, that we're doing with several other communities. And so um, uh, Chief Purcell, who's also on the call, as well as um, Ray Gothier as our interim public health director have been working on what that will look like in terms of staffing. Um, and so the discussion was that Westboro would be responsible for hiring um, the vaccine coordinator, so the person in charge of sort of the entire operation, making sure that there will be um, vaccinators on site, um, making sure everything runs smoothly. Um, the communities collectively um, identified um, retired Captain Brian Roberts as, the, as someone who would be really successful in this role, given his work with the Westboro Fire Department, but also um, his work with MEMA and his you know, ability to, to coordinate and, and his logistics skills. And so um, we would like to bring on Captain Roberts as the vaccine coordinator, but obviously we don't have that position um, in town. And so we're asking you to approve the coordinator position description. And it's a little bit more abbreviated. It's a temporary position. And so um, we're asking you to bring that on and then um, in turn, also update the personnel policies just to clarify that temporary employees don't receive benefits. Um, so this is a position that, um, you know, depending on how many doses we get, um, could that will determine sort of the amount of clinics that we hold. It'll determine the number of months that we're doing the vaccine clinic. Um, and so his hours will be varied. Um, and so... But, but as we've discussed before, this is reimbursable through FEMA. And so it's not an additional cost to the community. Um, we also, each town has taken on the responsibility of hiring one clerical position. Um, we're able to hire a temporary clerical position using existing um, job descriptions and classification. Um, so that's we're not requesting any approval for that, but we do want you to be aware that we'll also be hiring a clerical position and that is posted right now. Um, we've posted that position. So um, that's really all I have. I don't know, Kim, if you wanna be more detailed or if the board has questions about that. Um, thank you for meeting off cycle. We just really wanna get this up and running for when we have doses. 
Alan, I just had a quick question. Okay, go ahead, Ian. Um, Christy, the, the uh, clerical, just assuming, and for the public's record, that, that that is also reimbursable under FEMA? Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Alan, would you like a motion? Um, actually, uh, Sean had a question, and then oh, Patrick. We can do the motion first if you want, and then. But that's that's fine. Go ahead. I just I just think for the benefit of those um, watching, maybe I don't know if there's some details we can provide when we think we might get doses. Um, is it available to everybody in the state? Uh, is it going to show up on the mass website to be so you know as a selectable site? Sort of some of those details. Um, all great questions. I think I'll let Chief Purcell answer uh, those questions. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. Everybody's doing okay. So uh, first question was uh, when. We're hoping by April 16th, uh, but that's also subject to receiving the physical uh, vaccine here in, here in town. Uh, we have a plan that's set up that uh, Northborough will be ordering the vaccine. Westboro will be receiving the vaccine because we have the ability for storage and uh, others do not. Uh, the other questions were, oh yeah, so yes, state uh, system, VaxFinder is how people will be able to uh, sign up. Yes, it is open to uh, anybody uh, that is eligible regarding whatever phase we're in. Um, I think that uh, some priority will be given uh, specific to the residents of the communities that are hosting it, like they might get some advance notice. <clears throat> and um, I think I, is that it? Is that the only two questions really? No, so that, that Doubletree, if, if anybody had seen the other format that we had, uh, Doubletree Hotel was a uh, excellent venue, plenty of parking, ADA compliant, uh, room to stage after you receive the vaccine. So it was a full ballroom that, uh, that uh, has a, uh, an occupancy of over a thousand people. And um, the hallway, the main hallway down to that ballroom is where the vaccination will occur. Uh, there'll be two people at check-in, two people at check-out, and uh, I believe up to 11 vaccinators. So we'll be able to do about 120 people per hour. Uh, our hope is to be able to do 975 to 1,000 per day. And um, yeah, as long as they give us the vaccine. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Uh, Patrick, you had a question, then Ian. Yeah, first of all, it's great to hear. I mean, it certainly sounds like it's going to help meet the need. Um, I guess my question is this kind of policy related uh, and position related. I noticed in the um, the policy, it talks about like uh, the six month expectation of a temporary uh, employee, um, knowing that or likely that, um, you know, we're going to have mass vaccination needs for longer periods. I'm just curious, what is the longer term strategy for these positions in regards to, hey, this is this is happening now, but in six months from now, uh, people might be needing, or even eight months from now, people might be needing a, 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 a revaccination, right? Uh, Pfizer came out just the other day saying that their vaccination right now, they're saying it has an efficacy for six months. So I'm just curious, is there a longer term strategy and how do these roles play into that? What can the, what can the community expect for, for how this will play out over time? Um, I would say in regard to the personnel policy, the six month is given as sort of an example of, of what a temporary employee might be. Um, and so in terms of our immediate need, I don't think we have a, a concern. You know, obviously as we've all experienced, things are rapidly changing. And so we, we don't know what the long-term need of the vaccination clinic will be. And we don't know, um, you know, how long We'll, we'll be operating it. So I think, you know, and Chief Purcell, I'll jump in here, but I think right now our focus is on um, meeting the need for these initial doses that are coming over the next, as the phases are opening up um, in terms of who can get, who's eligible for vaccination. I, I think that's uh, exactly on. And I also think as, as, as we move further into this, there'll be less of a need for Mass, yeah, mass amounts of people to need the vaccine where it kind of start to spread out. Uh, people can, I, I would assume that they're going to transition to their primary kit, which is where most of us get other vaccines, the flu shot, except employers. But uh, I don't have an actual plan in place for that yet. I think they're still focused on getting uh, 
to create a good focus. Uh, I mean, I've actually runs here. I, I don't think there's a plan for long term. That makes sense. Thank you. That's the only question I had. Thank you, Alan. Okay, Ian, you had one more question or yeah, comment? Just really quick. I mean, I think um, as Chief Purcell said, I mean, DoubleTree has been uh, great. Um, for the vaccination clinic we held in the past, um, what was even greater was that actually they weren't in, they weren't operating um, as a hotel at the time. I did see, I think yesterday or the day before that they're, that they're reopening or have reopened. Um, any impacts you see from that, Chief? Or so uh, they had some large uh, large uh, events already planned, and uh, Kristen Black and Northborough has uh, been working with them. Well, we're just gonna work together and schedule the uh, vaccine clinics around their events so we don't hurt their business and they we still pay them and get the same opportunities that we had expected to hold the uh, the clinics. So which is kind of a really good public-private partnership. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, at, at this point, no one's got their hand up, so I would be happy to entertain a motion. Um. I will make that motion. Um, I will move to amend section 2.5 of the town's personnel policies as presented as the first motion. I will second that, Second Johnson. Okay, any further questions or discussion? Okay, then roll call vote. Uh, Johnson. Johnson, yes. Marshall. Marshall, yes. Keo. Keo, yes. Welch. Welch, yes. And Edinburgh, yes. So the motion passes a vote of 5-0-0, five being present. Um, we've focused mostly on um, the policy change. Were there any questions or comments on the job description itself? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion, motion to approve the vaccine clinic site coordinator job description as presented and to classify the position at H5. I will make that motion. Okay. And I'll second that motion, Selectman Johnson. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, a roll call vote. Selectman Johnson. Johnson, yes. Selectman Marshall. Marshall, yes. Selectman Keogh. Keogh, yes. Selectman Welch. Welch, yes. And Selectman Edinburgh, yes. So motion passes 5 0 0, 5 being present. Okay, our last um, agenda item. Um, is the memo from the planning board uh, regarding uh, uh, the location of the, one of the service gas lines to the Pulte development. So I will, um, Christy, are you gonna intro this yeah. or Jim or sure. I can? Okay. Oh, um, well, I mean, you certainly can. The, the, I had sent the board some information about um, the gas line that was proposed um, in 2018 um, for the Pulte development. And so you have uh, Jim Robbins on the call, obviously, um, you know, who is part of that process and has knowledge of it. And um, he'll be at the planning board meeting where this is considered on Tuesday. And then Derek Sari, our DPW, assistant DPW director is on the call um, who can explain um, why the, the gas line has been relocated from the initially proposed Lyman Street to Haskell Street, which is what the planning board will be hearing on Tuesday. Um, so, Alan, I don't, you probably want to add to that in terms of why the board is hearing that today. Okay, yeah. So, if uh, we can get an overview of why the gas line plan is changed and why it's moving. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. I don't know if Derek wants to talk a little bit about uh, how the DPW permits this, but Wait. I can get an overview. Okay, please do. Uh, I noticed that Selectman Welsh had his hand up. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Uh, if, if you can orientate us, I was taking a look at the diagrams and I just could not figure out what I was looking at. So if part of your piece can just orientate us to exactly where this is, um, that would be helpful. Um, I don't have a copy of the plan to show you. I'm sorry, I, I didn't expect that, so I'm unprepared, my apologies. The Just so you know, um, the gas line currently exists in Lyman Street. It's a 60 pound per square inch gas line, which is your typical line that you'd see in almost any street in Westboro. Um, that is not adequate pressure to serve the 700 units at Pulte. It is adequate to serve the first three buildings. So the gas line that is in Lyman Street currently has already been delivered to the first two buildings that are occupied and is being delivered to the clubhouse next. 
for future buildings, they would need to uh, install an additional gas line on Lyman Street. The reason that they are choosing not to do that or to upgrade the existing line is because the line would need to be upgraded near the intersection with Route 9. Um, so as Lyman Street approaches Route 9, there are more utilities in the street at Lyman Street. And it would be difficult to install the new line without conflicting with some of the other utilities as you approach the intersection with nine. So they looked at alternatives and the best alternative is to bring a new gas line down Haskell Street. This would be the same size, uh, 60 pounds per square inch. And it would come from uh, not the entire length of Haskell Street, but from Brickyard Lane as Brickyard Lane intersects with Haskell Street. It would then turn right on Haskell and head towards Lyman Street and would turn right on Lyman Street and enter the back of the site um, where the current main entrance to Pulte's Dell Webb project exists currently. The process for that would be that the gas company would send a letter to all of the residents of Haskell Street identifying the project, notifying them of their timeline, what the disturbance would be to Haskell Street, and offering each resident where the gas line passes to tie in. So if you were a resident of Haskell Street and you live between Brickyard Lane and Lyman Street, you would have the option to tie into this new residential gas line. The project is projected to last about 30 to 60 days. I told them to be more conservative um, and take the larger or longer timeline of 60 days, even though they think they'll be done less than 60 days. Um, they would require conservation commission permits as the gas line would pass through a low area where there's bordering vegetated wetland. And Derek can probably explain a little more about that. And then they would come out on Lyman Street where they would enter into the development. Currently, the site plan that was approved and the special permit that was approved by the planning board showed the gas line. So they will come back to the planning board next Tuesday and ask the board to make a determination that their new proposal is within the scope of the original plan and that this change is de minimis. The planning board can make such a determination without a, a public hearing. The notice to the abutters would serve as notice to the residents and we would treat this the same as we would treat any other gas line project. If we had a, a gas line project today to a subdivision, much the same as we had with say, Silver Hollow Estates, which was the most recent subdivision approved, we don't hold a special uh, hearing just for the gas line. We undertake the change of scope of the project the same as we would any other project. The planning board hears the proposal and determines whether or not a public hearing is required. In this case, it's a small change since there was already a gas line intended to be at the project and that gas line was approved. The board would discuss the proposed gas line on Haskell Street and make a determination at its meeting Tuesday night um, whether or not this is within the scope of the original project, which is probably what they'll do. And then the gas company would proceed to notify the abutters, um, meet with them if they wished, answer their concerns, if any, by phone, and then proceed with the work. Okay, thank you for that overview. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Patrick. So um, I, I, am I correct in thinking that the, when the original plan was put forth, that went through an open meeting and the abutters had an opportunity to, to talk, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to join that open meeting, is that correct? That is correct. The abutters though, the certified abutters list did not include all of Haskell Street. So, but the original plan was down Lyman, right? So. That's so the abutters on Lyman Street, so I'm thinking the folks, you know, on either side of Lyman near the lake there, um, you know, they were invited to those discussions. I'm not sure if any of those residents had intended to connect into the gas line, just like we're talking about for the Haskell residents now, if it does move, would they be included as, an, as part of the discussion with the abutters on Haskell? Um, 
as part of that open meeting discussion if it went that route? So the gas line already exists on Lima Street. If people who wish to tie in uh, on Lima Street would have already been tied in or okay. could petition the gas company to tie in. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, it, coming down Lyman Street was wasn't a, 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 a wasn't a second line. It was an improvement to the original line, right? To increase the size is what would have been required, um, and then they would have had to have reattached to that that line. Is that correct? So the state hospital prior to the Pulte project was served by gas, and uh, the Zaco and I forget the name of the other building that's out there currently is connected to gas, as is Allen Hall on the other side of the property. And that line served all of their needs. When Pulte uh, designed their project, they didn't realize that there wasn't enough pressure in that line to serve 700 units, because each one needs its own connection, as you know. Okay. So, so that's why this arose. Yeah, so there's no expectation of the butters on Lyman Street that there's a change to them other than if it goes down Haskell, it no longer will affect, you know, the road in front of them to be opened up. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, Shelby, did you you have your hand up? Yep, um, thank you. Um, Jim, um, was there any consideration for, um, rather than kind of bringing a gas line all the way down through Haskell, which is a fairly sizable distance. We had talked about this when this agenda item was coming up. Um, so I have a little background information. Is there any discussion around kind of the, the back side of what I'd consider the, like the Northboro side of um, the state hospital property in terms of accessing a line that would feed the property there it just seems more it seems less disruptive to a residential neighborhood just curious so i want to make sure i understand your question so do you mean bringing the the line from northboro or do you mean going cross country um i i i don't mean bringing it from northboro i guess i just mean on the what i would consider the the back side of of the state hospital property, the Pulte side, um, that there's no tie-in that is less disruptive. I'm just trying to understand if that was considered as part of this project or if you know. Well, they have to connect to the closest available existing gas. Okay, and that would obviously be Haskell or Lyman. Correct. And okay, the, that answers my question then. Okay. okay. Thank you, okay. thanks. Thank you. And, and so the decision on you know, the decision is, you know, clearly the domain of the planning board, right? And so our our discussing here today is really just because this does affect, uh, potentially affects a neighborhood um, who, you know, who are outside, uh, you know, the abutters of the original project, you know, the, the mandatory abutter, you know, notification abutters, you know, and there's been a lot of uh, visibility and sensitivity to aspects of this project. Um, the question is, do we want to send a memo to the planning board um, asking them to consider opening the, the special permit to, you know, to hold a public hearing um, so those new abutters would have an opportunity to, to be heard through that process? Uh, Shelby. So, so with respect to that, um, Jim, are there any other when 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 the if it were to be reopened, are there other aspects of beyond this change that could be um, discussed, influenced, changed of the special so permit? If they if the planning board were to reopen the public hearing they would determine the scope of the discussion. So if they said the public hearing is only on the gas line on Haskell Street, they could do that. There'd have to be other um, items within the project that were requested to be changed by the applicant to consider those things, or there would have had to have been something that came up, say, that was new to the scope of the existing special permit, or which was, say, a violation of the existing special permit and none of those circumstances exist. Okay. Yeah, because I, I mean, I think I want to find the balance here between notifying proper notification of those that would be impacted in their lives, although it's a 
relatively short duration of a, a project, as you've stated, um, while making sure that we're not unnecessarily interrupting construction and work and quality of life for those that are, um, you know, intend to make the Pulte neighborhood their home. So I think it, I think it's a balance, um, you know, that that's what I'm toying with right now as I'm thinking about this. Ian. Um, yeah, so I, I thought, I thought a lot about this and I, I'll tell you my, my initial reaction was, um, Absolutely, this should be reopened. And of course, in the back of probably all of our minds is the public meetings we've had um, with the gas company related to um, the Worcester feed line project, uh, Flanders Road, um, et cetera. Um, so that, that, again, was my initial reaction. Um, this I know I, I view this as as different now as I've heard more about it. Um, I think the, the the benefit to the neighborhood of of Haskell, which as I understand now does not is not fed by gas. The opportunity for those residents now to tie in if so desired, um, you know, some may view that as as a benefit on that side. Um, also, this this is a, an approved project um, and it's gas going to Westboro residents. Again, another differentiator from the, um, you know, current proposed project that is um, really about kind of end line pressure and really not about, you know, adding, um, as we understand it, uh, gas uh, to any uh, residents in, in Westboro. So, you know, I feel for the feel for the residents and, and that they, um, need some input. It sounds like there is a process through um, the gas company uh, to do that. So I have um, less concerns than I had originally. Um, and, uh, you know, we are doing something that has been done. And I think Jim mentioned it, which is another piece I didn't realize probably should have was the Silver Hollow, a similar type process went through. Um, I guess the big question here is this, this is going to be new for the folks on Haskell Street. Should they hear something and have the ability to speak on um, to the town, um, you know, elected officials and ones in charge planning board, or should they wait to hear it from the gas company? Um, so it's still debating it. Um, you know, I guess my, my leaning here is I, I do think it's a benefit. I think um, we need to move forward. We have to do something here. It's part of um, getting those um, buildings built, which have been approved. Um, but I guess I love to hear what other board members think. But I think the idea of you know asking the planning board to consider it, um, which is our preview, I don't think we can demand them to do it. But considering um, you know having a, a public a hearing just for this thing to hear from the residents of Haskell Street to me would um, would probably be in the best interest of of the um, the residents of that neighborhood. Okay, thank you. And Shelby, you raised your hand. Um, yeah. So I, I think that the I think it the right approach is for the town to notify uh, those affected on Haskell Street. Whether or not we need to have a public hearing, a notice of a public hearing, and the town is initiating that, um, you know, I'm going to look to our, you know, Jim to you, to Derek, to to Christy, to give some guidance there. I feel like providing notice of an upcoming planning board meeting where uh, residents can speak, albeit it's different than a public hearing. Um, you know, I think that they need to be notified. Um, I think the context that you've provided here to Ian's point, you know, in terms of uh, what the normal process would be, um, makes me feel better that we don't have to have a public hearing. But I do think as being good neighbors of this work that the notice should come from the town versus, you know, the, the gas company notifying them or all of a sudden, obviously, trucks showing up on their street and and all of that. So I think that some notice should be provided and a public forum offered with that advance notice. The specific okay. process I'll look to 
you know, um, you know, Jim and Christy to give some suggestions. Okay. So Thank you, through. Patrick. Oh. Yeah, I, I, great points. I think Shelby and, and Ian both made and some things I hadn't considered. I'm just curious what. Um, what would be the impact, you know, to, uh, I, I don't want to delay Pulte, right? I mean, I, Shelby, you made a great point about, you know, those are residents as well. They've got a project and they're, you know, they want to march forward to getting things done. Um, but I, I, did, I, I think there is a balance that we need to strike here with also the residents on Haskell Street and, and what it means to them. Um, what is, what would be the anticipated potential delay if we went, if our recommendation was, public hearing versus, uh, you know, a, a regularly scheduled planning board meeting where residents could come in and, and ask questions. So through the chair, I'll, I'll answer that. Okay, um, please do. Certified notice requires two weeks of advertising in the paper local circulation. It also requires that the planning board provide at least 30 days notice of posting. So it would probably delay them a month at least. I say at least because I don't know what that does to the gas company schedule because they do schedule projects. It, it might move it somewhere else in their typical work program. I don't know. Um, a little bit of other information off of that question is that if you had a gas project in town, on a street that didn't have a special permit or a site plan review or a subdivision approval, there would be no public hearing. So for example, we approved the writings to uh, phase two of that development several months ago, probably a year ago actually, and there's no gas planned for that project because gas line does not exist on Adam Street. If the gas company now determined that there were enough customers in that area of town, they may decide to serve that area of town. And there would be no permit in front of the town to hold a public hearing. So I think that if you have this public hearing, um, you might be requiring future public hearings for projects that don't have a permit in front of a, a local board. So I'm just bringing that up because procedurally, I don't know how you're gonna handle that going forward if you have a similar circumstance. Jim, just to, clear, to be clear, um, the DPW does sign a road opening permit. That's correct. And then the Conservation Commission is also, hears this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. And so, in, so thank you for that clarification. So in putting together the agenda and the packet, um, you know, Christy and I had a conversation. There's, you know, on Tuesday night, the planning board will be deciding whether or not this changes de minimis or warrants um, reopening the special permit and holding a public hearing. Um, so there were three options ahead of us. One, as a board, we could take no action because it's the planning board, it's their process, they're you know, an autonomously elected entity with this responsibility. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we could ask them specifically to um, open the special permit and and, and trigger the, the planning, uh, you know, and trigger the public hearing. Um, or in the middle, we could um, request that they consider um, the motion, which is a recognition that we've discussed it and we feel there may be a reason and it may be, um, you know, as they consider the balance of the developer, of the community, of, of the neighborhood, um, that, you know, we feel it warrants serious consideration. Um, but not going so far as to ask specifically for them to do it or in any way seem like we're directing them to do that, um, which is the way the draft motion is is written. Um, my thought was to take the min, you know the middle approach that um, I, I see you know I see the value um, because of the length of the change um, in and the fact that, many of the abutters of this pipeline were not certified notified abutters of the special permit when the project was first done, um, that they may have concerns that they want the planning board to hear, um, you know, before this change is made. Um, that's, you know, so personally, I think there's some consideration for it. I'm not sure it would set a precedent, um, you know, if that was, you know, a well-defined or that was the reason for you know, doing it, 
you know, other projects might have changes where the range of abutters doesn't change or the, the, the nature of the neighborhood that's abutting doesn't change. And so with that, um, you know, I, I guess my recommendation was, you know, sort of the way we put the packet together would be that, you know, we would send a memo to the planning board request that they consider reopening the special permit, um, but not asking them specifically to do it because that might be seen as a directive um, given their autonomy. Can I just ask, Jim, um, is, it, is it the case that um, the abutters, that all of the abutters of the gas line work were notified during the special permit process or just the abutters to the actual Poldy development? Sure, that's a good question. It, just the abutters within 300 feet of the property line of the Pulte project. So as you approach the intersection with Route 9, none of those abutters would have received notice. So anyone on Chauncey Circle would not have received notice, but those up at the intersection of, say, Haskell and Lima Street would have received notice. That's helpful. Okay, thank you for that clarification as well. Ian, something else? And then Sean. No, I was just gonna say that 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 was that was helpful. I Christy, thank you for posing that question, Jim, for your answer, because I was assuming something different. So that uh that was helpful information to me. Okay, Sean. Yeah, thank you. No, that was great. Um so the special permit was for the project and not the, the gas line. Um, so question, and I'm assuming this would be something the planning board would question is for this new gas line down Haskell, there's also, I'm assuming the folks on Bayard Lane and within that development are also not on gas. Would it be up to the planning board to request that the line or the ability to connect into gas be extended to those individuals? I guess we could request anything, but I, I don't know that there's any authority for the planning board to ask them to go outside the necessary scope because Bayard Lane, even Brickyard Lane, is not a subject of the project that we're talking about, which is the state hospital. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Derek, you've got your hand up. That's a good question, Sean. You know, it's in their best interest to have a tap off, you know, just because in, in the future they can go down here and make more money. So certainly that's something that can be can be recommended uh, that they do. We do that all the time for other utilities to stub off for the future. And I would assume it would common, hopefully be common practice that they would do that. Um, but it's certainly something that can be mentioned. You know, our role here is, like Christy said, we'll be doing the trench trench opening permit. And we'll issue that permit. Our team has looked at Haskell Street. Um, we're fine with the location, unlike we were not fine with Lyman Street because of all the other conflictions. Haskell does not possess those. We also have space for future uh, growth on that road if we need it, even with the placement of the new gas line. So on our end, we're fine with the placement. We won't issue that trench permit, however, until said time as if conservation requires a permit, get that permit cured. We will bring those conditions in full force and effect into our permit, because most likely it's erosion control and the like all within the right of way. So let them get that done. We will be the last issuing authority after everything is uh, settled. And um, that's that's our take on it. Uh, can I ask Derek a question? Uh, yes, and then Ian, uh, after, um, after Jim. So Derek, when, um, when a gas line is proposed anywhere in town, the DPW would require, be required to issue a street opening permit or trench permit. Um, at that time, uh, do you request that the gas company notify all abutters of their work? Or do they offer to you that they're going to notify all the abutters? It would be on upon them. That burden would be on them, not us. So I'm not sure if it's a, if it's something that we would request. I haven't seen that. The, the reason that I ask that question is I'm trying to determine what type of notice 
is given to abutters for a typical gas line project. Right. Hopefully the gas company would put out some type of a schematic, aerial schematic showing, you know, where it's going to be, where the staging areas would be. They're fortunate that Haskell ball field is right there. So most likely that would be the staging area. We, I don't know if that's been discussed. I haven't been part of the site walks, but pretty much duration, location, what side of the road, um, possibility for tie-ins if you're, if you're a resident, what's that process? Um, who pays for what? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm hoping that's what the gas company is comprehensively doing for all, for all notifications. Just like we do, we're gonna be paving soon. We send out all our notifications about our paving. So there is, there is a letter that's going to be issued by the gas company that Chris Payant has seen, that I've seen, that town engineer has seen, and it's a two-page letter that explains how the process works. It explains the pressure in the line. It explains the type of work that's done in the street. It explains the duration uh, of the, the project and the disturbance of the project. Great. Yeah, pitches are worth a thousand words. Hopefully they put a little picture in there too, just to kind of give the context. Okay, great. So Shelby had a question, but it was answered and Ian was actually next. So Ian. Yeah, just real quick. And it's actually following along there. And, and um, Derek or, or Jim, um, even though it's not your area of responsibility, Derek, I know you have some past history here, but I guess a similar way I'm trying to get um, a feel for the opportunities for the residents to have some public comment. It sounds to me like, um, while it's not a public hearing, there is a public planning board meeting. I guess, Jim, question there is if someone on Haskell Street requested to be heard at like an open forum, is that a possibility for them on Tuesday night in your meeting? I guess would be the first question. So the answer is yes. And um, they would be informed that this isn't a public hearing, but the chairman would allow them to speak. Okay, perfect. And I guess the second question then is um, to the point that there is, um, there's been brought that there is some potential uh, areas that come under conservation, I don't know, control or concern or whatever. I'm assuming that's a, that would be a public meeting where residents of that area would have a chance to in a similar fashion, while not a public hearing, have some ability to make a public comment either um, in person via Zoom or whatever, or via letter into the conservation. Is that Does that sound right? Yeah, typically on these types of linear right away projects, I never made gas companies file. Um, I would put any conditions into a memo that would be, again, brought forward into the dredge permit. I never saw a true value unless unless there was something in the roadway that I wanted you to fix, i.e. a culvert or something else. So I wasn't giving up all my policing powers. I was still going to get something out of you, but I wasn't going to drag you through the process. However, if the commission today does require a hearing, the unfortunateness is it has to be limited your questions to why the wetlands are not being protected or some question related to that. So the broadness of gas and this and that, the chairman most likely will not entertain because it's not wetland related. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so um, at this point we can either have a motion to do something or we can um, decide not to act and have the planning board, you know, proceed as they are, um, as they will do on Tuesday night with the public meeting and their determination. Can I just ask um, Derek or Jim, have they gone through the Conservation Commission yet, do you know, and received any approval? I don't believe so. Okay. okay. Is there any desire by any member of the board to bring forth a motion? Or is there an opinion that we should not and just let this follow the standard process? Shelby, you were first, then Patrick. Yeah, I mean, I'll bring forward a motion that 
um, uh, I'm trying to think what the motion is. I apologize. <laughs> um, uh, cause I, I, I think it's important that this board respects the authority of, of the planning board as a separate entity as long, along with all the other points that have been discussed here. So, um, Um, I apologize. I don't have the wording here. I don't know that the wording in our packet is what I want. So, sorry. So while you're thinking of that, I just wanted to, I just checked. Um, it looks like they have on March 30th, they received administrative approval for this from the Conservation Commission. So just so that we're all aware. Okay, thank you, Christy. Patrick. Um, just wondering if it would be appropriate to ask the planning board if they just make sure that this is a topic on their next planning board meeting so that there can be an open discussion. I think that's kind of a, a middle ground solution in that, you know, the, the community can still speak to it and ask questions or raise their concerns, uh, but it doesn't require, it sounds like, the full hearing, which could potentially delay you know, Pulte and, and their needs to, 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 to finish their, their work. It, it, should we make a motion something to that effect? I'm just. It is, it this is on their agenda for Tuesday. Okay, night. it is already on yeah. the agenda. Yeah, that's why we've been asked if we wanted to yeah. weigh in. So I'll, I'll try to make that motion. I, I moved to send a memo to the planning board requesting that they consider um, providing noti advanced notification Providing notification to uh, uh, affected abutters of this project um, so as to uh, allow residents um, to ask questions and be informed of the project. I'll second that. Okay, Ian, you also had a, I'll open up to comments, but you were, you had also raised your hand. Um, I did, but that was a mistake because I had a piece of hair that was flying across my screen and I, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a, uh, a virtual meeting issue and my finger hit my raised hand button, so I apologize for that. But I guess um, now that you've given me, I, I do have, um, I think my comment earlier, um, I've actually been, uh, I guess my view has changed by hearing um, the, uh, various comments that are here. Um, and, you know, this does sound like standard process. I think the big one was the fact that um, if this was originally planned to go down Haskell Street and not down Lyman Street as part of the special permit, many of those people on Haskell Street would not have received a notice because they weren't in the abutting area for the project so it would have just happened normally and i do think that um the other comp that hit me is that this would in some way set some precedent that i'm not sure um we want to be setting so my take here is while well, the motion's there i would be voting against that motion um at this point so i guess my, my, my point is just to let it follow the course that it follows its notice in the planning board that's the place for um, folks to hear about i think we've had this meeting hopefully people in the public can see that and that is the appropriate place for them to um, bring that up and then if there's enough folks that do it there it may make the consideration by the planning board as to whether they should do uh, something different um, hearing from the residents versus hearing from us as a board okay thank you ian shelby yeah, so, and I, I don't disagree with you, and I, I do worry about the, the precedent piece, and, and I think it's important for us to reflect on the comments that uh, both Jim and Derek made in terms of, and Chrissy as well, that, you know, that who would have received notice of this aspect of the project. Um, so I think that's a, a, a really valid point. However, I'm going to challenge the board in that one of the things we continue to talk about is communication and transparency to the public. And so while I don't want to put undue burden on the planning board or any department, I think there's an opportunity here to be transparent and say, this is a change to this project and it's going to impact 
the lives, you know, the daily lives for maybe two months of people that live on this street and surrounding areas. And so my, my I guess my question is, in what way can, can the, the planning board um, under its authority do this in a way that, I mean, it, it might be as simple as it's a social, I don't want to get into the weeds here, a social media post and a post on the town's website, because as much as we'd like to believe that a lot of people are going to watch this meeting on a Friday, there are probably not a lot of people that are going to watch it. And so short of us sort of randomly going on and saying, hey, be aware of this project happening, I feel like as a town, we should have a more uniform approach to to you know this sort of notice because so so I'm trying to I don't I I'm not in favor of opening the the public hearing I, I don't think that that's necessary but I do think that in the spirit of our our what we've heard from the community around communications we we have an opportunity okay Ian and then I have a comment <laughs> yeah sorry I mean and um absolutely agree about communication i've been the one pound on the table on public information officers folks know for for years here but um and so while i agree with that i almost feel like unfortunately the the planning board is going to take this up on tuesday and they're, they're going to make a decision one way or that and if they make the decision to not open the special permit on tuesday it's going forward without a public hearing, whatever. So while we could send a notice, I don't know that the value of that because the the decisions being made on Tuesday. I think if we had, because I like your proposal, Shelby, but it would be if it was two weeks ago where we had time to get notification out that the planning board meeting was happening. And and Jim, don't take this as a knock, as you know, it's not. You weren't required to send any notice out. It's something that we're talking about here. Um, so I guess. Well, I support what you're saying. I'm not sure that it's going to do anything, and it might frustrate people because we ask for something to be sent out, but they really have no recourse because, you know, the horse is out of the barn um, potentially come Tuesday night with, with what the planning board decides. Okay. So um, one comment that I'll um, talk call on Sean. Um, so in hearing in hearing the discussion, one of the things I think if 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 we're in consensus that, you know, we don't want to ask the planning board to consider opening the public, you know, the, the special permit, which would trigger the public hearing that we understand how these projects work and the original notification, what it would have been had the gas line been even originally down Haskell Street. Um, I'm comfortable with that view. I guess maybe it's not asking the, um, you know, the, the planning board, but, you know, basically saying that, you know, asking the planning board if they determine that this is de minim, you know, de minimis um, change and they're not opening the public hearing, um, that in addition to the notification that um, the gas company must, must do as part of the normal process, that the town would provide some, you know, notification um, to let people know that, you know, to expect communication from the gas company almost, right? And just thinking that, you know, you know, you get a letter from the gas company, you open up, it's not a bill, do you read it, do you throw it away, right? Um, you know, that type of thing. Um, it, it, you know, that it's really a communications request more than even a, you know, a public feedback request. So th those are my thoughts. Um, Sean. No, I, I agree with you, Alan. I, I think there needs to be some communication. I, I guess, though, this really, this gas line is is no different than any other, to me, that's a, that's ever gone in. Um, and so, you know, doing something specifically for this project doesn't make sense unless we're going to make a change and, and tell, you know, folks that going forward, we're going to notify you. We're going to make sure you're notified on all gas line changes. You know, it, I, I think it's a one-off. This probably doesn't make sense. Okay. So, um, Shelby, go ahead. But I, I guess the question is, are we reaching a consensus to take no action? But yeah. Shelby, go ahead. Yeah, I was well, just going to. So we do yeah, have a motion I mean, out just, there. So just as a, I mean, I, I do think it would be. I mean, 
for future consideration, whether it's through DPW, but I, I, or the planning board, depending upon the path that projects travel, I do think that um, we should require notice. Um, I mean, Derek, you provided some several different comments and ideas and suggestions, but uh, no offense, it sounded like there, there wasn't a hundred percent certainty of what kind of notice is often provided by the gas company, unless I misunderstood that. Um, so, you know, if you want to do business in town in Westboro, and I don't know what we can influence on public utilities, but to me, there should be a notice requirement in general, just to make sure people are aware of it, even if it's a standard project, but maybe we can't do that as a town. That's, that's for a different discussion, but as a resident, I sure would want to know when my street is being, um, you know, uh, disrupted. So, um, anyway, um, that, I just wanted to add that comment, nothing on the motion though. I think I've heard. I, I've commented enough. Okay, any additional comments? Looks like Jim had raised his hand. Oh, sorry, Jim. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I did raise my hand, thank you. Um, there, just to be clear, there will be notice to the abutters. We've already seen the letter. In all gas line installations, there is notice from the gas company to the abutter. So in my mind, it, the question is whether or not the planning board or the town gives notice to residents on a street where there's gonna be gas anytime there's gas line. I'm not sure that I would even know that they were proposing a new gas line on a street that didn't have a project proposed. Yeah, because we're not the project proponent, we usually let the project proponent, whether it's Verizon or anybody else, um, provide that. Unless, unless we're impacting the property in and of itself outside the right of way, then perhaps we would get involved at that point. Okay. Um, any, if there are no further comments, then we can move towards a vote on the motion as presented. Okay, do we need the motion read, read back to refresh our memory? <laughs> Is that a no consensus? Okay, then I'll move to, uh, or Christy, do you have a comment? Well, I, I wrote it, so I, I can try to read it back. That would be great, Christy, if you could. For it, I can know that I got it right. Um, uh, send a memo to the planning board and request that they consider providing notification to affected abutters of this project so as to allow residents to be informed and ask questions about the project. <clears throat> okay. I'm just not so, clear on when the notice would be provided. Um, I can amend it. I'm not sure it's going to make a difference based on what I'm seeing here and hearing, um, but. Um, I would just say a notice of, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm struggling because the end I'm going back to the timeline of when the meeting is tomorrow, uh, you know, on Tuesday. Um, so I'm not going to amend it, leave it as it is. Okay, any final comments? If not, Thanks, Mom. roll call vote, Keo. Sure, why not? Uh, Keo, no. Welch. Welch, no. Marshall. Um, Marshall, no. Johnson? Johnson, no. And Edinburgh, no. So the motion does not pass on a vote of 0505 zero, five, zero, five being present. That concludes our agenda for this meeting. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. Johnson moves. Keo seconds. Um, any discussion other than I will thank Westboro TV. Uh, I apologize for our late notification about the meeting. I appreciate you being on and recording and broadcasting this for us. Thank you. Okay, roll call vote for adjournment, uh, thanks Marshall. As, th sorry, thanks as well to the others, the town departments for being yes, on this call thank on you Friday. As well. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, Marshall, yes to adjourn. Keo? Keo, yes. Welch? Welch, yes. Johnson?
Johnson, yes. And Edinburgh, yes. So we are adjourned on a vote of 5-0-0, five being present. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us. Go Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs>